The book was better as a sentence we've all heard when someone's comparing a novel to its film adaptation. And I want to talk about some reasons why that people come to this conclusion and maybe debunk some of them, even though one cannot arrest personal opinion or account for personal taste. Nonetheless, there's, a, there's this reigning feeling that film cannot capture the spirit or the form or even the complete meaning of a novel. One reason is that film is said to be incapable of communicating to us the psychological depth of a character. And part of this has to do with that novels can have multiple characters and spend pages and pages and pages giving each a particular history and explore their particular choices and motivations, whereas a conventional film will focus on the adventure and the journey of one character and communicate to us their motivations in different ways. But the idea that they don't have psychological depth, I think, is a little bit uh, unwarranted. I was reading an interview with Michael Mann, for instance. Certainly not every director would work this way, but he wants even the most minor character to know where they came from, who their parents were, um, what their favorite color is, all kinds of little intricate details that he wants in that performance and that he himself wants to know as a director. And you can see this fullness in the way his movies play out. So the idea that you can't get the psychological depth of a character uh, in film, I think you can. It just has to do with how the film is approached, the kind of research that the director and the actors do in order to flesh out what they're doing on the screen. Another objection is that films cannot impress us with the vast periods of time that novels deal with. And this assumption can be true, but it depends on what period of time the novel or the film is dealing with. And one thing that films do that novels don't do so much is that films have depth of plot. So there's a difference between screen duration, the amount of time that the film plays across the screen, is it at 90 minutes, is it 120 minutes, and plot duration. And so we can pick up a lot of things that happened in the past through dialogue or suggestions that don't need to be uh, dictated on the page the way that it would. So you can have 100 pages of past that are dealt with in two seconds of dialogue. And uh, David Mamet has a great example in the movie Red Belt, where a character basically walks onto the scene and he meets a character he knew from the past. And the guy says, did you tell them about that experience you had in the military? And the main character says, no. And this gives us a very, very vast period of time in the novel, in the psychological journey of that character, without telling us any details about it other than that he had been in trouble and that he hasn't talked about it. So that's a really great example of compressing huge history for a character into a matter of seconds. Yet another exa uh, example of how films can't deal with the depth of a novel is the idea that films can't express the enormity of societies. Um, and this, again, depends on the kind of work that's doing that the film is doing, depth of plot, uh, as opposed to the screen duration. So those would be sort of spiritual or psychological elements of what a novel is doing uh, and in comparison to what a film can do. And I think the assumption that films cannot do these things is highly questionable. Now in terms of formal considerations, one feeling is that film cannot be controlled the way a book can be controlled. You can't go to the theater and say to the projectionist, stop, 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 I want to think about the last five seconds before we go on. This is a, a formal impossibility. You have to sit there and watch and contemplate the film later, and you have to do so without having the film in your presence. Now obviously this isn't true of DVDs or Blu-ray or having a movie on your iPod, but nonetheless, in terms of strictly going to the theater, you have to deal with it in real time and you can only think about it later. Whereas with a book, you can have that book in your hand, you can have it in your pocket, you can take it on the subway, train, plane, whatever you like. Hopefully you're not reading it while you're driving. But you can stop and think about a sentence for hours, you can think about it for days, weeks, months, years, and the reader is in much greater control of the text and the access they have to it and the amount of consideration they can give its many parts. So in other words, what people are doing when they say the book is better, is they're holding reading as an ideal, an ideal way to access stories and to really access them and to kind of own them in a temporal and spatial way. 
Another thing here is that when we read, we're not committed to visual images or tones of voice or various styles of speed and editing. Uh, Stephen King has talked about in his book on writing about how he doesn't really like to give too many details of what clothing people wear. Um, he lets the he likes to let the reader fill those details in as part of their own experience. So this lack of commitment to different details in the novel is is a pretty fascinating thing and you could just choose to ignore uh, what piece of clothing a person is wearing and come up with your own style that they should be wearing whereas when you're watching American Psycho those guys are wearing suits and that's just the way it is you could imagine that they're not but there's a very real tangible sense that that you're committed to what they're wearing on the screen for the duration of that film so reading, in comparison to film, is said to generate the largest pool of associations because it's not committed to any particular set of details. Um, that's a theory. Now, ultimately saying that one medium is better than the other is a very subjective claim. And more than just subjective, the criticism requires that the person has actually read the book and seen the movie. Uh, but we know people, we all know people who've said the book was better than the movie without even having seen the film, and possibly without having read the book. They're just sort of jumping on the conclusion, uh, based on some of the things that I've said, that films are just incapable of being better than a book. And this suggests to me that adaptations have a kind of psychological use value in everyday conversations. When we come across an adaptation of a novel, we can formulate opinions that we can use in social situations that give us personal clout, or at least the illusion of having personal clout. Um, it almost reminds me of Nietzschean slave morality, where someone will gain power over someone else by telling a, giving a sort of narrative about novel as being more powerful than film, and then getting getting <laughs> getting a real higher position in a conversation by resting their opinions upon a classical a medium in comparison to a new medium. But I think the real reason why people love to say that the book is better than the movie, and why we need to be suspicious when people discount remakes and every other kind of adaptation, is because there's a cultural fear of the copy that goes all the way back to Plato, where every imitation was said to have a pure representation in heaven. So this chair I'm sitting on, for example, is really just an inferior copy of the perfect chair to which all other chairs refer. And this platonic way of looking th at things gives the illusion that someone or something is in control, that there's some place where the perfect copy or the perfect original exists, and that that perfect original is sort of to be kept holy or free from the flurry of reproduction and the stain of a copy that is less than its source. Um, and really, if there is an original, then there is a source, and there's the feeling that we can reasonably and safely track back to that source and see the progression and see every copy as a kind of degradation of the source. And this gives us a feeling of security when we can see this history and we can see how it was altered and revised and think back and, and have security in ourselves of that first experience we had, which may have many, many pleasant associations. But the irony here is that, all respect to Plato, there is no original. One of the central claims that I make about adaptations, and that I'll be doing in all my videos on adaptation, is that copies are not only all that we have of things, but the very notion of original is false. <laughs>